So for our first practical example of GoPigeon code, we'll take the Hangman program we wrote in regular Pigeon and rewrite it into GoPigeon. And there's not much different, except we basically just have to specify our types. For example, this is the one we wrote in regular Pigeon, and here's the one in GoPigeon, and we say that our parameters start and end. We have to specify that they're integers. And we say that the function itself returns an integer. And then its local n is a float. And inside here, uh, another thing we have to do is that our arithmetic operations, uh, any one operation has to have uh, operands of the same type. You can't mix integers and floats. So here, if we want to multiply n by the result of this operation, well, this is returning an int because both n and start an integer, so this subtraction returns an int. But we want to multiply it by this float n. So we need to uh, convert. We have to get the float equivalent of this integer value. And we do so with uh, using f as an operation. And then uh, same deal here. We want to take this integer start and add it to n, but n's a float. So we have to uh, convert our integer into a float. And down here, the floor operation takes a float and returns another float, but our function needs to return an integer. So we're going to, so we use i as an operator to get the integer equivalent of what floor here returns. In the other functions, there's nothing much different except uh, when we deal with lists, we have to specify what kind of list, and we're dealing with lists of strings. And down here um, in the original code, we just use the list operator to create an empty list, but you have to specify what kind of list. So this is creating an empty list of strings. It's a specific kind of list. Also notice that in our for each loops and our for each loops, we have to specify the types of the variables. So here we have to specify that the counter variable i has a type integer. And it's always going to be an integer, but for consistency, we make you write the i there. Uh, same deal in for each, the, the counter, the index, that we iterate over is always going to be an integer, but you have to specify it explicitly. Uh, but then for in a for each, depending upon what kind of thing we're iterating over, in this case, a list of strings, that determines what type this thing has to be. In this case, it has to be a, a string because we're iterating over a list of strings. Now, understand that in real Go, as we'll see later, they don't have a built-in list type. They only have slices and arrays. So the way we would write the same equivalent code in actual Go is we'd use slices. So here let me just demonstrate this uh, main function where here we have it written using lists of strings. Um, but here's the code if we had slices of strings. And here I'll quickly uncomment this. There's a couple differences then. Uh, the first is that in this version with lists, um, the found variable is a list of strings, but it starts out nil because list variables hold references to lists. And until we assign it this new empty list of strings, found is referencing nothing. And you can't do anything with a nil reference. You need to have some actual list referenced first. And then what we do in this loop is we're pushing values onto the list. We're mutating the list referenced by found. We're tacking a thing onto it every time through this loop. With a slice, here the found variable, we don't have to initialize it because its default value is already an empty slice. It's something we can append to. And so down here in the loop, instead of pushing, we use append on a slice. And the critical difference with slices is that when you append, uh, the append operation is not really modifying the found value itself. What, what found stores is still a slice pointing to the same array with the same length and capacity. But append will return a new slice that may, may point to the same array or may point to a new array if, if there was no more space in the original array and we needed to allocate a new one and copy everything over. But whether or not it points to a new array the new slice here will have a length that is greater by one, and that's what we need. So every time you append in this loop, we need to modify found itself. We need to assign the new slice value to found so that each time through, the length of found is increasing by one. So just watch out for this when working with slices. It's a very common mistake to forget to uh, modify your slice variable after doing an append because append is not mutating the original slice itself. It's mutating potentially the array which the slice points to but it's not changing your slice itself. So that's what the code would look like with slices. I'll leave it to you as an exercise if you want to go through and change the rest of this code to also use slices instead of lists. Now let's look at something slightly more interesting and something new. We're going to read and write files because in GoPigeon we have operators for doing so, which we didn't have in regular Pigeon. In regular Pigeon, all we could do for input and outputs is print out to the console and read from the console. But now we have a few more operators including open file and write file and also close file. Ignore the fact this isn't highlighted. That's a, a bug in my syntax highlighter, which I'll fix.
Anyway, so this program here is going to write some bytes to this new file called myfile.txt, and let's walk through it. So first off, the open file operator, you specify as a string a so-called file path, which is specifying the name of a file and also where it's located. There are two kinds of paths. There are absolute paths and relative paths, and absolute path specifies exactly where, where on your system the file is supposed to be located, whereas a relative path is relative from the directory in which your program is running. So it, um, this is a relative path, so it matters where we run our GoPigeon program from. So it'll, it'll be relative from the directory of your, your command prompt when you, when you run this program. So this will look for a file called myfile.txt. If it doesn't exist, it will create it. As you'll see in a, in a real environment, in actual Go, you'll have more control about determining whether, well, if I want to open a file that doesn't exist, should it create it or not, you have control over those details. But for simplicity, the operators in GoPigeon just um, don't give you these options. Anyway, so assuming my file.txt doesn't exist, this will create the file, and what it returns, what open file returns, is an integer, which it'll be assigned to file here, and a string, which will be assigned to error. The integer represents a so-called open file handle. Uh, when your program runs, every file it opens, there's a unique integer which is associated with each open file. And we need that integer because subsequently when we do stuff with the open file, like write to it or close it, we need to specify that number, that integer, to specify which open file we're talking about. We don't really care what the actual integer is. Uh, generally, the operating system, when we open files, it, it, gives, it assigns file handles that start from zero or one or two or three or something, some low number like that and just increments. That's usually what it does, but there's no guarantee and we don't really care. All that really matters is that the number should be unique for every open file. Anyway, so the error here, the string that gets returned, that is an indication of whether or not the operation succeeded because every file operation we do may fail because the nature of input output devices for reasons beyond control of our code, it might not work. Um, and so the operating system, when we do these operations, we're making requests to the operating system, asking it to like read these files for us and write data to these files for us. And it may give us back an error saying that for whatever reason it couldn't. There are many different reasons why it can't do these things. Um, maybe the hardware failed. Maybe when dealing with files, maybe you don't have permission to do that operation on that file. Uh, various reasons like that. Uh, we won't go into any details here. But what we do need to know is that we need to get back some value indicating whether or not the operation succeeded. And if it did fail, we need to hear about it. We need to know, know what kind of error it was. And so the way the operators here in GoPigeon work is they simply just return a string. And if the string is empty, then that means the operation succeeded. If it's not empty, then there was some kind of error and the string describes what went wrong. So what we're gonna do is after each one of our file operations here, we're gonna check if error, if it's not equal to an empty string, then something went wrong and we're just gonna print out, hey, something went wrong and abort the program. Because th this is the kind of error where, for the purposes of this program, if we can't open this file, then our program can't really do anything, so we might as well quit. Normally we would expect it to work, but even if these occurrences are rare, uh, like the hardware fails on a, on a rare basis or something else goes wrong on a rare basis, you don't want your code to just blithely continue on when something goes wrong, right? You want to try and cope with the problem if you can, maybe do something else, maybe try again. Sometimes that uh, is appropriate in some circumstances. But in this case, for our purposes, we're just gonna quit. Sometimes you can't do anything, so you just have to quit. And that's what we're gonna do. Anyway, so assuming that the file opens successfully, error will be an empty string and will come down here and we'll create this slice of bytes and assign it to bytes. The slice of bytes has three bytes. It has a byte with value 100, two, and 255. Those are just random values I chose. Um, and then we do a write file operation on the file. This is the file handle integer that we're, so we're specifying which open file we're talking about, the one open file we have. And we pass in bytes, the slice of bytes, and it's gonna write out all of the bytes to the file. Well, this is gonna try. Uh, again, for complicated reasons having to do with details of the operating system and the hardware, a write operation might not successfully write all the bytes you want. It might do a partial write. It might, uh, if you request to write a thousand bytes, it might write only half or, or 600 or, or something less than a thousand, right? And so we get back a number, an integer, uh, which we're gonna store in N here, which tells us how many bytes were actually written. And we also get back a string, which we store in error, indicating whether or not something went wrong. And w when a par partial write does occur, we get an error, we get a non-empty string for error. And so we're not actually gonna really use N here. We actually don't really care what it is because a partial write is a kind of error in a sense. 
it's not normally expected. It's a relatively rare occurrence, and I won't even go to the details. Uh, the circumstances under which you get partial rights, they're, they're fairly exotic, but they, they can happen, and when exactly that is depends on your operating system, depends on various circumstances that we will discuss here. But anyway, so then we're going to check after the write. We check error to see if it's not an empty string. If so, something went wrong, and we print out the message of what went wrong, and we bail out. Anyway, assuming that the bytes were written out in full and everything was fine, mm -hmm. then we're going to continue on, and we want to write out the string to the file. And the way we do that is we first have to get a slice of byte equivalent of the string. That's what byte slice does. It gets us a slice of bytes representing uh, the data making up this string. And we write that out. And same deal, we have to account for the possibility of an error, but assuming there is no error, we continue on. And now we're done. We've written everything that we want out to the file. And at this point, we could just abort the program. We could just quit. We don't need these remaining lines of code, but we're going to explicitly close the file. And what that means is that every time you open the file, there's the, the file handle associated with the file. And internally in the operating system, it keeps potentially a bunch of information about that file. It might allocate some memory to store buffers for it uses when it reads and writes from the from the files, and, and so it's good practice to explicitly close your files because in a, well in a short program like this when we just abort the program when we just close the program, it automatically closes any open files anyway. So we don't really need to do this. We don't need to explicitly close the file. But imagine a longer running program where. Uh, say like a program that runs indefinitely as like servers do and over the course of their running they they can open many files and you don't want to leave open a bunch of files you're no longer using you want to make sure to close them and so it's generally just good practice um, it's a good habit to form to just always explicitly close your files to make sure that you're not accidentally leaving them open so just for sake of imbuing a good habit here we're going to explicitly close this file and again for fairly odd reasons um Files that you try to close might and it might actually fail. So we actually should check for an error message saying we couldn't explicitly close the file. There's again not anything we could do about it in this case. And again, the circumstances under which a file might fail to close are quite exotic, and we'll, we'll defer those questions until later. But for now, we'll just check for the error, and if there was an error, we'll, we'll acknowledge it. We'll print it out to the user and return. So that's a program that writes a file. Now let's look at a program that reads a file which is quite similar. Uh, the opening moves are the same. We just uh, open the same file in the exact same way, check for the error, return if there was an error. And then to read data from the file, we need a so-called buffer. We need a, a slice of bytes to read the data into from the file. And just for good measure, we'll make it much larger than we actually need. We'll just make it a thousand bytes. So we have a, this is creating a slice of bytes for the thousand bytes. And then the read operation, like write, gives us back an integer we store an n here, uh, indicating how many bytes were actually read, because reads can be partial, like writes. But in the case of a read, that's not necessarily considered an error, because it's actually very common for reads to uh, not read all the bytes you requested. And in this case, because our bytes here has a length of 1,000, the read file operation will attempt to read up to 1,000 bytes. Uh, in this case, assuming that we didn't modify my file to text, we just wrote it out with this program, and now we're going to read it, well, we know that this... Um, we know it's, let's see, this is, it's like 20 bytes at most. It's, it's not a large file. So 1,000 bytes is actually way larger than the file we're reading. So this is definitely going to be a partial read. But it may even be less than the full file. Let's say it's 20. So it could be like 10 or 5 or, or something less than the file. Anyway, so the first time we read, what we're going to do is we need to check if there was some kind of error because maybe something else went wrong. Maybe, maybe the file we were reading was on a, a flash drive and the user, as we were trying to read the file, yanked it out of the drive. Something like that could happen. Other things could go wrong. So uh, in the event of error not being an empty string, something went wrong, but there's a special kind of error we're going to check for, which is an, an error message denoted EOF, capital EOF, uh, standing for end of file. And this is the error we get. That's not really an error. It's just indicating that, hey, you reached the end of the file, and so you're done reading the whole thing. And in that case, we're going to break out of our loop because we're reading, we're reading in, a, in a loop that just keeps reading because we, we know the reads are going to be partial potentially, and so we need to potentially read more than once. So in the event, though, that we reach the end of the file, that's when we break out. In the event it's some other kind of error, and then we print out what the error message was and we just abort the whole program. But in the event that there wasn't any error at all and we're not at the end of file, then we're going to take... Uh, from the byte, you know, the data was copied into the byte slice, and we want to read those bytes 
and it was only n bytes though, so we slice bytes from zero up to n because those are only the rest of the the buffer, the rest of bytes is not um, not anything. It's not useful data. It's just whatever. It was just a bunch of zeros actually the first time th through. So we just want the first n bytes of the slice. We then take that slice of bytes, convert it to a string. That's what this operation does. And we're going to concatenate it to message and assign the result to message. So each time through this loop, message just starts out as an empty string. But the first time through this loop, we read some number of bytes, convert it to a string, concat that to message. And so each time through this loop, we're reading more data, converting it to a string, and then tacking that string onto our existing string message. We're just building up the string each time through the loop. Uh, do you understand this is really not an efficient way to build up a string that we read from a file because um, what we're doing is like, imagine it was a very large file and so the string would get very large and then each time there's this loop, we're taking the existing string that might be very large, tacking on a little bit more to it and you know, and then creating from that a, a third new string which is, which is the size of those two combined. And imagine doing that many, many times and you're creating all these large strings um, in, a, in a very wasteful, unnecessary way. Uh, when we get to real go, we'll we'll have a, a more efficient alternative to this solution. So, but for now, this works for our purposes, and we're dealing with a small file anyway, so we're not going to notice. Anyway, that's how we build up our string. And actually, something I haven't said explicitly is that when we read and write from a, an open file, with an open file is associated a so-called marker that, as you read and write from the file, it advances. So, say we open a file that's a thousand bytes in size and I read 10 bytes from it. Well, the marker starts out at, when you open the file at the beginning of the file, you read 10 bytes, the marker advances by 10 bytes. So the next time you read, we're not starting at the beginning of the file, we're starting at the, at the 11th byte and reading from there. So every time we read, the marker is advancing. And eventually, the marker is going to advance to the end of the file. And when we try and do a read operation, there's going to be zero bytes left to read. And that's when we get the end of file uh, error. Only when the marker is at the very end of the file when we do a read. So that's what's eventually going to happen here. Most likely, this will just take uh, two iterations. First read will read the whole file, and the next read will give us back end, end of file. That's the most likely thing to happen because we're talking about a very small file here and a small amount of data, but not guaranteed. So it could be more than two iterations through this loop. Anyway, when we break out of the loop because we reached end of file, we have our, our contents as a string message. We can print that out, and then we should close the file just like we did in write file, and we're done. Okay, so now let's look at these two programs in action. First, we're going to run the write file program. Here we go. And let's see if it created a file my file.txt. Yes, I see it. We'll type out its contents. And there we go. Uh, and what it's printing out is, well, the first three bytes we wrote were the value 100, 2, and then 101. In Unicode, 100 is the value lowercase d. Uh, 2 is a non-printing character, so that's why we see this funny question mark box. Um, and that's what the command prompt displays when it doesn't know how to print a character. And then E is 101, that's lowercase, yeah, so that's right. And then hello uh, file world right here. That's the other stuff we printed out. Okay, so, so far so good. And now let's do the read file, um, where do I have it? Read file program. And <clears throat> yeah, it's reading in the file and then printing out to console what it read in and it looks the same. Okay, so that's all good. Now let's do something a little bit more interesting. We want to write out what's called CSV data. CSV stands for comma separated values, not commas, comma separated values. Um, it's a informal format. There's no strict uh, specification of what this data format looks like exactly, but there's just a set of conventions and, and common practices. Uh, the idea is that it's a text file where each line of, of the text represents an individual piece of data or a composite piece of data made up of some number of elements. Those elements are separated by commas on that line. So say we have our struct cat made up of a name, weight, and age, and we want to write a bunch of cats out to a file. Well, it would, CSV would make sense. It's a suitable format for that purpose. And so each line would be a name, then a comma, a weight value, a comma, and then an age value, and then a new line at the end uh, to go down to the next line. Uh, understand CSV is not really appropriate for all kinds of data. It's a very simplistic kind of uh, data representation. It, it works out fine for a lot of things, but uh, for, for data that involves a lot of things that le stuff that's more binary, like say a large array of a bunch of numbers, uh, you it would be an inefficient way of storing that data and, and generally not a good idea. Um, but for some simple stuff, like say these cats, it, it makes sense. So um, what a program here does is uh, looking down at main, we create this slice of cats um, with three cats. 
versus Cat Oscar and Mittens and Fluffy. And we're then going to iterate over all the cats. And for each cat, we're calling this method CSV, which we defined right here. CSV method takes your cat and returns a string representation of that cat. Uh, it's returning an individual line uh, for that cat. So we first get the name, and, and we decided that we were going to go in the same order here. So name, weight, and age. Um, that's important to keep the order in mind. So we get the name first, uh, then the weight and the age. And name is already a string, but weight and age, weight is a float, age is an integer. So we have to convert those to strings. So we do so like this. And we're going to concatenate it all together, putting commas in between them. And at the end, we have a new line. What this is, we haven't discussed this before, I don't think. Um, inside strings, backslash has special meaning. The character backslash doesn't represent a backslash. It represents the start of a so-called escape sequence, which in, is um, two characters, first a backslash and then some other character, together form an escape sequence representing some kind of character which we otherwise couldn't put in our strings. We couldn't type it and show it in our strings. So new line, for example, our, our, our strings in GoPigeon can't span across multiple lines. So you can't just put a new line in the middle of your string. If you want to write a new line in your string, then you have to write backslash n. And those two characters together are an escape sequence representing a new line character. There are a few other escape sequences. There's backslash t for a tab character, backslash r is a carriage return character. Uh, and then backslash backslash is how you write an actual backslash. So because backslash itself is used to denote the start of an escape sequence, if you wanted to put an actual backslash, you'd have to write two of them together. And so now this string, if we wrote this, these two together represent a single backslash, and then this would be a lowercase n, not a new line character. So this would actually be a two character string, whereas this here is a one character string, just a new line, which is what we want here. So. <coughs> Um, so that's our CSV function. It spits out an individual line representing that cat um, as a string, but it's not actually writing it to the file yet. Anyway, so in our loop, we're, for each cat, we're getting the CSV equivalent, concatenating it to S. So each time through, we're building up the value of S. S starts out empty. Each time through, we tack on another line representing the cat. We're then just going to print that out so we can see what we have just for uh, demo purposes. Um, and then we want to write it out to a file. So we want to take this, uh, this string s, write it all out to a file. I've created this write function, which takes a file name, uh, some, some file path, and a slice of bytes. And then it returns a string, which uh, is an error value. So upon success, we want a write function to return an empty string, but then on failure, it returns something else, some message explaining what went wrong. Um, so in write file, so we're passing in test.txt, the name of our file and we're passing in the, uh, the string, the, a byte slice from our string, so the, the byte representation of our string data. Um, and inside write, we open a file, open the file we specified, test if there was an error. If there was some kind of error, well, we can't proceed, so we should just return, return the error message. Um, and then we try and write the file, and if that succeeds, then um, if, that, or if that fails, then we return early. Otherwise, we go on and we close the file, and. If that fails, we return early. Otherwise, if all of these operations succeed, then we're going to return an empty string indicating that the write uh, completed successfully. So down here, after calling write, assign the result to error, and then we check if error is not equal to empty string. And if it is and something went wrong, we'll, we'll print out what the error was and return, because in this program, we can't really do anything in that eventuality, so we might as well just abort. But assuming that uh, complete successfully, the write happens successfully, then we can go on and and then, um, actually we don't even need this line, that's not, not even correct. Um, and then the next line, let's see, we're printing out the, well this is not even correct, uh, if you want to get the byte slice from a string you do that, but that was just printing out the length of how many bits bytes were written, but we don't even need that, so I'm just going to delete that. Anyway, so this is, it'll print out successfully wrote file cats.csv, and that's also wrong because I didn't call it that, let's call it that, cats.csv. Okay, now it's consistent. So now let's look at the read CSV program, which is going to read in that text file we just wrote. And for each line, it's going to interpret each line as a cat. As for each, each line, we get back a cat struct. And so here in main, uh, we have this function read we've defined, which we pass in a path, and we get back the full text of the file, and an error message if something went wrong. So 
Uh, we'll look at that function in a second, but um, after we call this function, we check that there was an error. If so, we print out what the error was in return because we can't proceed really. Our program has to just abort. Um, and then we're going to split the lines of the text. We have to find a split function, which you specify a, a string. It'll go through the string, and for each occurrence of that string, it'll um, split the, the string into two, into pieces. So if I have a string with a bunch of new lines in it, then I get back a slice of strings, which is all the stuff around the new lines, not the new lines themselves. So we'll look at that in a second. So effectively, we're getting all the individual lines as individual strings in a slice uh, without the new line at the end. And then for each line, we call the read cat function, and that returns a cat struct assigned here to C. And if there was some issue with the format of the text, if it wasn't a properly formed cat, like maybe it was missing commas or something was wrong about the data, well, then we get an error. So our read cat function will return an error message if there was something uh, wrong. So we check after calling read cat, we check if, uh, if error was not equal to empty string. And if so, we just abort because something's wrong with the data and we'll just quit. Uh, otherwise, we proceed and we take that cat C and append it to the cat slice. So once we go through this loop, for each line, we'll have a cat struct in the cat's slice. And so at the end of this, well, we'll just print out the length of cats, which in this case should be three, because that's how many we wrote out to the file. So let's look at the read function. The read function takes in a file name, returns first a string, which is the text of the file read, and then this string, the second string, is the error message, if any. Um, and so first we open the file, check if, uh, check if there was an error. Then we have our buffer. This code looks really exactly the same in that previous read file program. Um, we go through a loop where we read from the file, uh, we get some number of bytes back, and if there was an error and it was end of file, that means that we're reading from the end of the file, and so we break out of the loop because we have everything we need. Um, otherwise, we append to text, uh, we tack on to the text string um, everything we read from the file, and that's what this line does. It's exactly the same as what we did in the uh, read file program. Anyway, so we get through the loop, and once we're out of the loop, we can close the file because we're done with it. We test if there was an error in closing the file, and in the end, we return the text. Oops, there should be an empty string here. So every time we return, we need to return two values. In the case there's an, an error, the first thing we return is just an empty. It doesn't matter what we return in that case, really, so we might as well just return an empty string because all we care about and if there's an error, all we care about is that uh, what the error message says. But then upon success, the error message is the empty string, and then text is whatever we read from the file. So that's the read function. And the split function is kind of involved. I'm, I won't actually go through it as an exercise. You can uh, see if you can figure it out. There's probably a, a simpler, more elegant way to write this, but this works, at least in my testing. So given some string, we want to split up into multiple strings and some splitter string. In this case, it was the, the new line string. We get back a slice of strings and I'll leave the details for you to look at. Anyway, um, so the read cat function, that's more significant here. Um, that we pass in the individual line without the new line at the end, and what we want to get back is a cat and then a string if there's some error. Th this will be empty string in the event that we could properly parse a cat, otherwise we get back some message indicating what went wrong. And so we have our individual line, but the three elements that make up each cat are separated by commas, so we're going to split the line, uh, splitting it on comma, and we should get back a slice of strings with three elements. The first should be the name, the second thing should be the weight, and the third thing should be the age. And first we'll check off if the length is correct, because if elements is something other than three, then there's something wrong with the line. It's a misformed cat. It's not properly a cat. So we're going to return in that case. Well, um, we don't... I actually just created this variable cat here to make it easier to return a cat we don't care about. It's, it's just defaulting to an empty cat that has no values, like it is an empty string name as a weight and age of zero. But in the event that there's an error, we don't really care what we're returning for the cat. We just want the error message here. So just as that's just a convenience thing. That's why I created this variable C here, so we can make it easier to return a, a cat we don't care about. Anyway, so in the event there aren't three elements separated by commas on the line, we that's what we return as our error message. And anyway, we proceed on to the next line. What we want to do is we want to take the second element, the element in index one, and it's a string, but we want to read it as a float. It's, it's, it's a sequence of text characters, but it should be interpretable. It should look like a, a float value. And so to get a, a float 
representation of that string, uh, we have the parse float operation. Be clear, in the, in the previous program, in write CSV over here, uh, we just took our, our float value and converted it to a string. We can do that easy enough, but this is a separate operation because we're going the other way around. We're taking our, our string and getting a float. And so for that, we have parse float. And the thing about parsing a float, or and also parse int as we use here, is that maybe the string is malformed. Maybe it's a string that doesn't look like a float. So maybe like what we want is something that looks like this. And that's something, you know, a string that looks like this. And that's something we can use parse float on. But if it looks like this, well, that's not a float. And if it's, it just has characters that aren't valid number characters, well, that's not something we can parse either. So in the event that it's a string that isn't properly formed as a float, doesn't look like a float, then we get back a non-empty string error message. It's actually an operation that returns two values. It returns the value, which we assigned to wait here, assuming it's successful, but then upon error, it returns a non-empty empty string here. So in the event we can't, it's improperly formed, if it's not a valid float string, then we return. And then for the age, it's the same deal, except we're dealing with an integer, so it's parse int instead of parse float. But same deal, we have to account for the possibility that it's malformed. It doesn't, it's not properly uh, interpretable, uh, readable as an integer. In any case, assuming it's properly formed, everything's properly formed, we get down here and we have our name, weight, and age. And actually I made a mistake here, let me correct this. We don't actually use any name variable. We just need to get the first element from the elms slice. There we go, that's our name, which is a string. And weight, which is now a float, and age is an integer. And this is a success case. So for the error string, we return an empty string. So that's the readcat function, works on each individual line. And that's the whole program. So down here when we use readcat, we can take a line and get back a cat, or we get back a non-empty string error message if, if the line can't be interpreted as a cat. So let's see if we can get these uh, programs to run. First off, write CSV. Okay, that seems good so far. Uh, let me look, yeah, it's cats.csv is there. Let's type out its contents. Um, oh, I need to work on this. The, the way it's uh, converting floats into string values is in this format. We probably don't want, we want it to look something more sensible, cleaner. We don't need this engineering notation style, but let's just go with it for now, that, that's valid. Okay, and now let's look at the read CSV program in action after I've made some fixes just now. And it prints out three, which is correct because we have three lines, each one represent a cat, and that's how it should be. So it seems to work. We could delve in more and see if it is actually creating the cats correctly, but I think we're good. Well, let's try it. Let's try printing out the actual cats, see how it prints it. Yeah, there we go. That all looks good. 